Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another live stream. Uh, flying solo tonight. Um, as you'll see in the chat, my co-host David is a little under the weather. Um, to be fair, I'm feeling a, like death warmed up because I'm full of cold. But um, we'll keep it going as long as we can, and we'll get we'll see what we can get done tonight. Um, so um, let's start with let's start with. Um, uh, a shout out to everybody who's in chat tonight. So I can see we've got a lot of the regulars in. Uh, Tim popped his head in, some dude, two dude on YouTube. Um, I'm guessing Tim's probably gaming, so he's just uh, popped his head in to show uh, solidarity with us all, but he probably won't be around. Uh, we've got Paul Howells in from Pandy Man Entertainment. Got a little treat coming up. Um, some insider info that Paul's given me to share with you guys on the stream, um, which I'm grateful for uh, and which I think you'll enjoy. We've got Cheese Me. Um, uh, we've got Because of Ben or Stroke Crispin. We've got Darren Harmon. Hello, sir. Um, uh, so, yeah. Uh, good evening. Welcome to another stream. Um, for those of you who um, haven't uh, been here before or haven't seen us before, um, this is our regular Thursday uh, hobby live stream where we get to talk about tabletop gaming, um, mostly war games, but we touch on card games and board games and all that sort of stuff. Um, the main purpose of tonight's show, as it is every week, is to give you something to occupy some of your senses while you crack on with some hobby work. So if you're in the chat, like Darren has done, um, please let us know what you're working on tonight. Uh, there's almost certainly going to be technical difficulties, cheese me. Even with me flying solo, I'll manage to cock something up. Don't you worry about that. Um, yeah, so stick it in the chat if you're working on anything. Darren this tonight is working on some uh, metal midlum and warp miniatures. Darren, like me, does like his classic metal sculpts. Can't beat them. Um, I'm going to have to put in an order for to Twoth Mark to get myself some more burrows and badges soon. Um, I haven't painted them in forever. And I've done everything I own, so it's time to expand the collection. Um, so uh, what am I? So let's for those of you who are noobs uh, and are catching us later on YouTube, let's break down the format for you. So uh, when we run these live streams, we tend to do the same sort of things. The first thing that we'll do is have a chat about what we're working on. Obviously, David, if you're doing any hobby, stick it in the chat, mate. Um, uh, then we will talk a little bit about the uh, Monday Night Gaming Club um, that uh, we attend and what I played and what game I, ha I enjoyed. Uh, then we will talk about some news, just a few videos I picked up on YouTube this week that I thought were cool. Uh, have a chat about those. Um, then probably a little bit earlier than normal. We normally go around nine o'clock into the main theme, but uh, as I'm flying solo again, I'll probably do it a little bit earlier. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is the maths that lies behind gaming. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're playing a board game or a card game or even a miniatures war game. There'll be some sort of randomization in there, whether that's a deck of cards or a bunch of dice or something like that. So um, we, we just sort of have a chat about, you know, maths and probabilities and whether people actually think about it whether it scares people off gaming or or not and you guys can chip in as usual in the chat because that's what this show's about really it's about the audience having their say and david and i just fucking steer things along their merry way so um let's do what i'm going to be working on first because then i can get this camera boom out of my face and actually get on with some work so um Earlier in the year, David had the genius idea that we focus on terrain. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and when when somebody starts with the old uh, 52 deck of cards, then it really gets crazy, doesn't it, Darren? Um, so uh, we said he said we were going to make a commitment to focus on terrain because like most gamers, we don't really focus on terrain enough. So the stream Hello, Shakos and Sprues. Hello. Um, good to see you, even it is, if it is but brief. So, I have... Um, the first thing I'm going to be doing... I might do more than one thing tonight. Hey, 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 hey. Um, the first thing I'm going to be doing 
Um, I'm not planning on murder. This is my airbrushing sheet. So what I tend to do before I use my airbrush is I just put one of these cheap decorating sheets that you get from hardware stores for if you're doing painting around the house to, to catch drips in carpet and floor and that sort of thing. And then I cut a, a, a piece that's about three by four, something like that, and just drape it over my hobby desk and it catches all the overspray, stops me fucking up my keyboard and doing all that other stuff. It's a really... Um, it's a really easy little fix for it. If, you, if you're planning on doing any airbrush, particularly if it's a communal family area, just chuck one of these sheets down and you can de-stress a lot of it because, it, it you know, you really can just focus on what you got to do and not worry about, you know, bloody marking your kitchen table or messing stuff up. So that's that's what the sheet's all about. So this is the first thing. What I've done is I'm back on my frost gray project now. Um, for those of you who've been here before know that I was working on one of the Frostgrave missions from Into the Breeding Pit supplement, which required some quite specific terrain. I've started a project on the on tabletop um, uh, project system, so you can go and have a look at that. Um, I don't know what's happening with my um, uh, mobile camera, but it seems to be lagging like buggery but anyway here we go so i've got my bridges these are the stretto bridges from tt combat designed for use with the carnivale game um but they've got a fantastic span they're about four inches across so um these are great for all sorts of games and they cover the sewers with um uh yeah yeah i mean do you know what? i don't i don't know what I don't care what project you're doing. Look at these bridges because the other thing is these are insanely cheap. I bought these from some third party seller and I paid, I think it was nine quid for a pack of three. So these MDF bridges, which are quite smart, work out about three quid a throw, which I don't think is bad. Um, you know, they're, they're huge um, and they have real table presence. So, um, we uh i'm gonna basically we're, we're airbrush priming tonight so uh there'll be some asmr airbrush noise in the background hopefully um to for your satisfaction so if i get through i've got six of these to do because i bought two packs um if i get through all of them which i may or i may not do um the next thing i might try is i have a huge table of actual carnivale terrain that I bought from UK Games Expo. For those of you who've not been to UK Games Expo, TT Combat, um, every year they have a big trade stand and they do table deals. But I think it's sometimes somewhere between four and six deals they do every year. And the previously, they basically give you an entire four foot by four foot table for 100 quid. Uh, so if you want to buy 40k Wild West infinity death uh, drop zone commander carnivale oh oh for use the table of terrain for any game in fact if you want to buy a four foot table packed full of mdf terrain they're a great buy um they take your money at the show and then ship you them probably a week or two after the, the turnaround tends to be fairly quick i think every year we've been david and i have splashed out on one because they're just such a great deal um so I have got a ton of these. Um, so in Carnivale, which is a game set in uh, Renaissance Venice, sort of late 15th century, I think it is, 16th century. Um, you've got, you. the idea is you put a water mat down, um, which is your canals, and then you build the land structure around it with these baseboards. So they, they're various geometric shapes so that they're modular. And I've got a ton of these. So if I get through my bridge priming, I'm just going to keep the airbrush running and get a few of these primed if I can. Um, uh, and we'll see how it goes. Um, the only thing I have realized, I've failed to prep thoroughly and I haven't sealed this MDF that I'm working on tonight. Now... I'm using the polyurethane primer from uh, Vallejo. Now, the polyurethane 
should be robust enough to go straight onto the MDF without any undercoat. Um, a lot of rattle can primers and stuff like that, I would seriously suggest just painting them with a watered down PVA mix just to so uh, seal the surface because this MDF just sponges paint up. This polyurethane that they put in their um, airbrush primers, it sprays on like a plastic film and is pretty resilient. So I'm hoping these will cover quite easily. If I eat my words and it goes fucking horribly wrong, I don't know what I'm going to do. But let's, you know, that's the plan as it stands. So, yeah, that's that's what we're working on. Just put that in the box out of the way. Right. Um, right. Let's get this phone out of my face because, uh, frankly, it's too much. Um, and we'll just turn that off so that the battery doesn't die. Uh, right. So let's crack on with it. We need an airbrush, don't we? We have we have an airbrush here. Um, we need some primer. Um, I tend to use... Now, the other great thing about the Vallejo primers is they come in such a, a really good range of colours. Um, well, I say, I'll rephrase that. They come in a great range of grey shades <laughs> and neutral tones. So you've got everything from black right up to really pale greys. Um, so what I've done is like a 50-50 mix of ghost grey and black, um, which creates me a, a, a sort of a mid-grey tone. I, if you wanted to do it in one, there are plenty. I think they do a German grey colour, which is their sort of like dark bluish grey um, that you see used a lot for historical German uniforms, World War II. Um, uh, they do that, and it's probably the way to go. But because I've got... I'm just going to use what I've got. So I've done myself a little blend, got myself a little pot, and I've done myself a 50-50 mix. Um, so that's what I'm working with. Right, need an airline. Let's do that. So we hope you've had a good week uh, since we saw you last. What you guys been up to? Gaming, I hope, um, and getting some hobby done. Uh, Oh, before assembling. Yeah, the, to be honest, Ewok, their, their table deals are always very impressive. And their table range. Now, David and I mentioned this. Here's, here's the dream that TT moved from raw MDF into pre-coloured MDF. Um, printing. <laughs> oh, that's what you're up to tonight, is it, Chris? Been printing. Okay, good man. Uh, and watching Shogun. Excellent. We like the Japanese stuff. Um, yeah. Can you imagine if TT went into pre-painted? Oh, mate, that would be so good. The fucking terrain range is already killer. The only problem is, is like when David and I thought that we were sort of theory crafting and dreaming on Saturday night. The problem with TT is, um, and it's not really a problem, I guess, in one respect. Their, their stuff is very much designed, I think, for bang for buck. So a lot of their stuff is very simple to construct and it has a lot of etching, surface etching in it. Um, to give you the detail and the relief now the problem with pre-colored is if you want unless you want everything flat single colors you've then got to redesign your kits so that you your detail pieces are on separate sprues so you can give them separate colors and then particularly with things like this so like this is one of their kind of alley buildings now all of this detail like these windows and these uh, the window surrounds and the sills because these are actually you know the these are had to hand paint and if you were to do these as insets of a different color this kit would have to be completely redesigned because all this is look like one piece <laughs> with uh so it, you know i can i i can see why they wouldn't but i wish they would because pre-colored is the way to go mdf is such a lot of work um ewok's been ill as well Oh, trap nerve. Fuck that, man. I've had a couple of twinges in my back, Ewok. And uh, nerve pain is... Yeah, 
that's the other problem, cheese me, that it will be a cost hike. But their stuff is so cheap. I think they could stand it. I'd still buy it, mate. Um, particularly if they take all that work away. Um, I mean, it's again, I I used to buy the the foreground stuff. Now that that really was premium and it was expensive. I mean, you were paying what thirty five to forty pounds for a a single building sort of this size from the old foreground guys would have been 40 quid ish um which is like double what tt would charge for something like this um but and the assembly times are huge compared to this because obviously all the different pieces but they do look bloody smart um yeah, no, that's understandable, mate. Uh, I'll be honest, as I say, last night I was wrapped up in a blanket on the sofa for about seven o'clock. Um, it was touch and go whether I was even going to get a thumbnail done for the show, but um, we we cracked on. We we soldiered on as we have to do um, to keep you guys entertained and to give you not not give you an excuse for a night off because you know what would that show? Well, you know what sort of example would that be? Um. Anyway, back to the job in hand. So, I've started my airbrush up. I hope it doesn't piss everybody off too much. Um, but here we go. Let's crack on. Now then, um, club night. What did I do at club? Um, so, let's get that up here. <coughs> I am pleased to say... But do you know what? Building the TT stuff is awesome. I mean, these bridges were an, an absolute dream. Um, that they're, they're um, they've got assembly instructions online. You don't get anything in the kits, but we've all got access to the internet, so that's not a big deal. But yeah, they're not stressful at all. <coughs> um, because the complexity is low, but that's the trade. I mean, again, it's all trade-offs, isn't it? Low complexity, simple kits, cheap kits. That's what we want. Um, I am pleased to say I got to play Infinity. Um, I don't play enough Infinity. Um, but then again, I don't play enough of every any game really. Um, uh, I would like. I I would be more than happy to just game every day of the week. Um, a different game, but you know, life real life can't can't do it can you so um i got to play infinity against alex so alex it was only alex's third game so alex is still uh very much in the learning mode of infinity for those of you who've um played it you'll know that infinity is a good game but infinity is not a simple game by any stretch of the imagination to be fair Infinity does feed nicely into tonight's um, topic of conversation, but we'll come to that when we talk about the main topic. Um, uh, it it was a very one-sided game. Um, so we were playing... I made a bit of a faux pas. Basically, uh, Alex has, hasn't really got any models of his own, so he was playing... Our club has got the Red Veil starter set, which is Yu Jing and Hacker's Lamb. Um, and the port, the, the forces are about 175-ish points. So he played the Hacker's Lamb starter models from Red Vale. And I played uh, the same amount of points, but from my actual proper uh, J JSA, Japanese sector secessionist, sorry, army um, collection. And I made a mistake or a miscalculation because I forgot that and and to be fair, this is a a cau and cautionary tale to anybody who's sort of like teaching somebody a game or leading somebody through a game into a game. When you get starter boxes of models, it's not just about the points; it's about the variety of the models included in that box. So, for example, I could easily build a hundred and seventy-five point list, which on paper looks fair. But when you have like an entire army's collection to build from, I was able to access specialists and power troops that were over and above what Alex could field. So um, 
what happened was we had a very one-sided game where my armored battle suit, um, the Daiukai Dengekitai, mouthful, um, basically marched up the top of the side of the table. So if you look at this table in the image shown, I'm on the right, Alex is deployed on the left as the game gets going, and I sent my battle suit up the top of that picture up um, so if I'm deployed on the right hand side on my right, I sent it up the table, basically engaging the models one at a time and basically blowing them to bits because I have that model is equipped with a Panzerfaust for armored and uh, armored targets and quite an effective machine gun called a Red Fury for engaging other models at mid range. Um, and basically I went up there and hammered through nearly half of his army into my turn one um, just with that single model. Um, so it was a little bit lopsided. Alex told me he still enjoyed the game, although I did get massive feel bads. Um, uh, and again, he, Alex is engaged in learning Infinity and there's a lot, there is a lot to learn with Infinity. Um in fairness to Alex, my dice were also rolling a bit bloody hot. So when I started the run with my battle suit, Alex had played very well. He'd got um, he's got a battle suit. I think it's called a Facede. And again, it's a heavy infantry armored power suit with a heavy machine gun. And he'd placed it so that it had really good covering fire for uh, where my battle suit itself would emerge from the cover. It was so Alex's um, uh, Alex's uh, battle suit was placed uh, towards the bottom of the table on his side with a good diagonal line of fire from uh, cutting across those containers to the buildings um, uh, just in front of my deployment zone. And. As I popped around the corner, I had to use my missile, my Panzerfaust rocket launcher to do to basically take him out. And I I had no right winning that dice roll. Um, the, Alex was rolling four dice, I think, looking for 13s. And I was rolling one dice looking for 11s or 10s. So he had me massively outclassed. But it just so happened his dice completely whiffed. I got the hit. He then failed all of his armor rolls spectacularly, which shouldn't have happened, really. Um, and with that armored battle suit removed, my Diokai was then just free to do its fucking thing. Everything else was completely outclassed by it. So the game could have been dramatically different based on that one dice roll. If, if that Facede had put some wounds on me, won a face-to-face -face -face exchange. Because the other thing is my Panzerfaust was limited shots. I only get two shots out of it the whole game. So if I'd whiffed both of them, I was then in a similar position where I couldn't destroy his facade either. <laughs> and it was a bit of a Mexican standoff. But I got lucky. I ploughed up the side of the board. I ended up winning 10 points to two, I think it was. It, it was an absolute car crash for him. Um, once he'd lost the facade, all of the other models just kept dropping. Um, and again, I didn't need to use any, I didn't need to utilize any of my other resources. I just kept pumping order tokens into the Diokai and it was, it was horrible. But then in turn three, just to sort of like, um, redress the balance a little bit and make it feel a little bit less of a, uh, a shit show for Alex, I did a completely reckless thing and, um, used my, uh, lieutenant to go on a mad lad run up the left side of the table just basically vaulting over buildings taking bullet shots and uh trying to um just just basically playing for fun um take doing making completely ration out there actions taking shots and, and just sort of like trying to give him a chance to redress the balance um, but as I say, the, the early start meant that it was not something he was going to come back from. So, yeah, there we go. That, that was what I did at club on Monday night. Um, I don't think any of you guys play Infinity, do you? Any of the regular crowd? Do any of you guys play Infinity? Oh, I need gloves or I need a glove. Da da da. Where are my rubber gloves? Where are my fisting gloves? Oh, no.
Hang on. Where are my gloves? Ah, there are my gloves. Oh! Ah. Ever think that you own too much crap? I get that feeling all of the time. Oh, God. Right. We have a glove, so now we can spray. Um, it's not for everybody, Darren. Why the hell is my monitor cutting out? Um, it's not for everyone. Um, oh, Paul's played it in the past. What did you think to it, Paul? Um, out of interest. Teaching him to love the game using the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not my finest moment. Uh, as I say, Darren, if I'd have thought about it, probably wouldn't do that again. Um, but hey, do you know what I mean? What, what can you do? You, you've got to, uh, roll with the, roll with the punches, as they say, eh? Um, yeah, uh, fucking, to be, in, in fairness to Alex, awesome opponent, the man's an absolute, um, I mean, He's not scared of games that can be spiky as fuck. Alex's favourite drug of choice is 40k. So I don't think Alex is at all. And he plays in tournaments. So I don't think Alex is a stranger to the concept of being alpha struck on turn one and having all of his toys taken away. Um, I think that's definitely an experience he's had before, uh, which helps. Um, I'm not trying to defend my miscalculation in any way, but... Um, as I say, I think it definitely was a factor in Alex not flipping the table and walking away in disgust. Um, plus the fact, I think he genuinely, he's a, a crunchy war gamer who likes things that, games that give you a challenge as the player. Um, and, and that's one thing that's definitely true of Infinity. You're not, you're not cruising your way through in a game of Infinity just chucking dice and having fun you need to think about every action before you take it. And, um, and as I say, I'm going to mention infinity quite a bit, probably in our late, later discussion. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, but I, th I think the idea is that he has two cause he's a fucking great big robot. That's the one of the, again, do you know, what? it's funny. There are some things about infinity that other war games, um, would probably consider heretic heretical so in infinity there is no such thing really as the concept of WYSIWYG. models are made and sculpted almost entirely using for an aesthetic sense if that makes um sense to everybody you uh so like for example the Oniwa Ban, who is like the super elite ninja of the Japanese army, he's sculpted just with a sword. I think there are two or three sculpts they've done, and they're just basically a ninja with a fucking mega sword. Now, when you take the ninja in the game, he always comes equipped with a ranged weapon option, so a submachine gun or a boarding shotgun or something, but they are not modelled on the on the model. And the vast majority of the Infinity model collection is like that. There are multiple profiles you can build and nobody expects you to WYSIWYG it and have the, exactly the right weapon for the profile that you're using because that's just not the way the game is played. Um, you, there, is a, there is a convention, if you're, even if you're not using their excellent free Infinity Army app to play the game, there is a function when you use the Infinity Army app on, on a PC. You can download a PDF courtesy. It's called a courtesy list for your opponent that basically lists all of your models, all of your profiles, all of your equipment so that your opponent is not going to get gotchered in any way by what you've got based on the models you're losing using. Um, so. Yeah, that. Um, that's fair. Paul says that in fee found in infinity overwhelming at first. I, I definitely would expect you to say that Paul. 
um, even even as a veteran who's been playing games since I was in my teenage years, and I'm now 52, so you can work the numbers out for yourself. Um, there, when I first played Infinity, the first three games, honestly, I had very little idea of what I was doing or what the hell was going on. Um, it, it did feel extremely confusing and extremely different, but I rose to the challenge and I've now um, grown to love the game. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, so the silhouettes, Darren, are they're, they're more for line of sight calculations. So again, uh, infinity for line of sight, because again, models are designed with an aesthetic sense paramount. They want them to look as beautiful as they can look. Now that might mean that your model has is like in jumping into the air or has a massive sword outstretched and long arms or whatever. So what they do is they issue silhouettes, which you can get in cardboard from Corvus Belly or loads of third party aftermarket producers make uh, lovely acrylic ones or MDF ones. And basically each model has a, an S profile or a silhouette profile. <clears throat> so if you want to ever determine does your opponent actually have line of sight because it's crucial for the way the game works then you just literally pull your model off the table and replace it with its silhouette which um sits on the same base size and it'll actually show you whether that if you can see i think it's i think in the rules if you can see two millimeters square of the silhouette two square millimeters you have line of sight um so yeah um i i would say that i would say that everybody should try infinity um i think that's a good way of putting it paul whether it's actually a game for everyone i'll be the first to admit it probably isn't um but i do think everybody should try it and the more hardcore you are so the more that you really are into the challenge of a game and um you know almost wargaming on hard mode the more you should consider infinity as maybe looking at it see if it's got something to offer you um but yeah so yeah i i love the game i love the game and um i mean i don't i honestly have lost um count of how many games i've played but i still feel after i've played a game of infinity I've walked away with a better idea of how to play my models for next time. Um, I'm still learning um, how to use models effectively, what strategies and tactics to use. Because, um, again, a lot of that stuff in Infinity has, has a very unique feel. Um, it's not reproduced in a lot of other war games. Um, I mean, it, 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 the thing is, there isn't... The other thing that makes Infinity intimidating is that it, there's nothing it doesn't really in include. It includes rules for hidden movement and um, uh, in, the, in the camouflage system, you have if you have um, models that are disguised from your opponent, they get placed as camouflage markers and your opponent literally could, the only action they can take is to identify you until they identify you they can't attack you they can't uh, you know act offensively towards you they've just got to try and spot you first um and it's really clever the way that they've implemented a lot of it it's a very good rule set um and free there there is a fantastic uh, officially sponsored and maintained wiki uh, the Infinity Wiki, which contains all of the rules and FAQs and all that jazz. So they do do a, a rule book, which you can download for free. It's hundreds of pages and dense as hell. Um, or you can just play with the Wiki and your army app to keep looking up keywords and things. Um, uh, and uh, even, the, even the Wiki has got breakdowns of how actual skills and things work during the game um but as i say if you want all of the classic stuff like a rule book and that you can get it i think they even do a printed copy of the rule book that you can pay for if you want to go down that route um but as i say um apart from the models the rest of it you don't need to pay, spend money on i mean obviously 
spending money on nice order tokens and all that stuff is is lovely but it's not it's not required not but not at all um but then again the models aren't cheap so you know it they even if they've only got you buying the models they're not giving them away you know infinity models are not cheap things but they're beautiful metal casts multi-component many of them now i think they do some resin for the bigger pieces yes they do that yeah um darren makes a good point there so because um infinity is quite a beast um several years ago now they released a version called code one which a lot of people will have seen um now essentially code one is exactly the same game in terms of its basic operations so um orders still work the same order tokens still work the same um combat still works the same shooting still works the same etc etc the main difference is in uh um oh fucking hell in code one it just left my 50 year old brain for a minute um in code one what they've done is they've effectively stripped the models of their special abilities and reduced the number of options you can take. So, like, let's say, for example, there's... Let's take the Aniwa Band, the elite Japanese ninja. Now, don't quote me on this because I'm just literally th talking shit off the top of my head because I've never played one. But let's say, for example, in the main game, Infinity, I can take an, uh, an Aniwa Band... Um, an elite ninja with either a boarding shotgun or a submachine gun and i can take the new ban as a lieutenant model and i can take the new ban as a hacker model so it's got a hacking console and can attack other things with cyber attacks in code one for example they might say yeah you can't take the lieutenant option uh, or you can only take one of the gun options or you can't take the hacker variant Everything is pared down so that there aren't overwhelming options when you come to list building um, and things tend to operate in a more simplistic way. But the, gr the fact that the actual core game operates the exact same, if you ever feel that you're, you've had enough and want to play full fat infinity, as I call it, you just switch over. You don't need new models. You still use the same models as you would for Code 1. You don't need to learn a new game. The only thing you need to do is recheck your profiles and learn all the new keywords and learn all the new abilities and how they might work in the game. You know, so your your new model might have mine might have the ability to lay mines, which it never had before. Or your model might have the ability to throw smoke grenades, which it never had before. So you just have to learn how smoke works or the mines rules work. Um, as I say, <clears throat> they've done a lot to make the game more approachable. To be fair, Corvus Belly are a very good company all round. They they really they they're a real steady as she goes company. They do release consistently, and they have released other game systems. But they don't, they, they don't, I don't know, they don't smash you over the head with it. They don't put, the, nothing seems pressure selling. They don't do limited deal stuff very often. A lot of their starter sets have a short shelf life. So like Infinity Regular goes through iterations of starter sets. Um, two player starter sets by that I mean. Um, so you might only be able to get a particular variant for a year or whatever. And then the next season's two-player starter is a different, two different factions with a different set of cardboard terrain or whatever. Um, but like, <clears throat> although they do retire models, it's not every other week. Do you know what I mean? You can buy most of the core models for Infinity that you always could buy. Do you know what I mean? If you if you want stuff, you can get it um, without spending a fortune or having a complete stress attack um so yeah 
let's just finish this off. Just FYI, I was right about the primer. This is one heavy coat um, going through a Badger Patriot at about 35 PSI. And this primer is going on clean. Um, there is some of the original MDF showing through just on the corners where there's the etched texture for the flagstones. But mostly it's covering clean with one heavy coat. So I think I've got away with it, lads. I think I've got away with it. Let's see how we're doing for primer. Oh, got plenty yet. Got plenty yet. We don't need a refill just yet. So, um, should we move on to our next thing? Um, um, we've talked about club night. Let's go to, let's talk about this. So, Paul Howells, who's in the chat, is um, the uh, big brain behind Pandyman <coughs> Entertainment. Um, and Paul has designed a couple of miniature war games, I guess you'd call them. Um, his first one, Threat Level... Z is it Threat Level Zero, Paul? I do forget what your first one was called. Is a an unusual sort of like cooperative um, come solo effort, effort where you play... Um, uh, essentially, think of it as you're playing members of the emergency services trying to deal with um, scenarios that might have arisen such as injured civilians or trying to arrest individuals etc if say your police or ambulance service um, uh, but his second game which grabbed David and I's attention is a first world war trench game called trench offensive now Paul had a fantastic um, handmade demonstration table to run Threat level emergency response. Thank you, Paul. Um, had uh, a fantastic table, demo table for threat um, threat offensive, um, at which we saw first, I believe, at the Dicini convention in Norwich. Um, and he sent me some sneak peeks. His tame terrain building friend has built him a new table for this year's cycle of shows so if you guys are going to a gaming convention this year and pandy man are going to be there you will get to see this in all its glory so paul sent me a few pics now um this is an entirely hand sculpted table um uh all built from scratch and modeled um, shout out who's the name of the guy who did this, Paul, because I, I don't think I asked you. Um, and uh, let's go to the slideshow and go through the pictures. It's got some fantastic features. Um, yeah, I think Paul's going to have this at Chilcon. Chilcon, don't if any of you guys are going. It does it. It, it looks absolutely fucking amazing, doesn't it, Darren? So he's got some. Um, He's got some extra little features. We've got the crashed plane. Um, I assume it's crashed or diving very close to the ground. David Folks. Awesome, mate. Awesome. Um, and then he's got a little machine gun emplacement at this end of the board. Um, again, it's got the beautiful textures, sandbagging at the top. One of the great things about um, uh, Trench Offensive. I keep getting the bloody name wrong. Um well, one of the great things about Trench Offensive is this fact that there is an interaction between No Man's Land and the trenches. So you need, if you're building a game board for this or playing this game, you need to be able to have access to make sure you put your stairways in, make sure you put your ladders in, because the rules, the rules for going over the top are a part of the game. So you need to be able to interact with that area of the table having people locked into the actual tunnel network is going to miss some of the subtlety of what's going on. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's um, 
as as I say, Paul was good enough to send me some of these pictures and it just looks amazing. Now, this board um, has got a little bit more greenery to it than the last one. The other one was very grim and muddy and um, fields of the Somme. This one's a little bit less bleak with some strategically placed grass tufts in a nice vibrant green. Um, but the best part, um, and I'm not sure if Paul's going to take, I mean, I imagine transporting both is going to be a fucking nightmare, but the, um, just look at that plane. Isn't that fucking amazing? Um, I did say to Paul, is that actually like a, is there an objective? Is that an objective for a mission or something? But apparently it's just decoration for now. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, but that, as I say, the best bit um, is that these this trench table does fit alongside and maps into his previous one. So he can place them side by side and have uh, a, um, a, a, a whole a trench network table that blends together. Um, which is enviable and absolutely fucking brilliant. Um, but. <clears throat> oh, do it, do it, Ewok. To be fair, the, um, the, the hobby overhead with Trench is pretty big. But like we were saying last week, Trench is a game where the, the actual gameplay overhead isn't huge. You can get into it and play the game really simply. But if you really want to, you know, indulge yourself and your artistic creative side in building a table for it. Oh, my God, the potential is huge. Um, uh, Paul, you, I know you played around with the... Bill, you, you, you had an idea to make an MDF framework for making tables to give people like a, almost like a substrate to hobby on. How did you ever sort of full, complete that project? I remember we saw some prototypes at Peterborough. <coughs> did you get the, the whole idea finalized and get the finished pieces up onto your, um, uh, website or or are you not quite ready for going to market with them because i do think that if you had like a because the problem is if you look at a lot of the pre-existing trench network because you can get mdf trench oh man keep watch this space guys watch go to pandeman entertainment's website and look at their uh keep keep nagging paul to get this off the ground because the problem is when you look at existing trench stuff it's either it's mostly designed to sit on a flat table and it's what i said to you a minute ago the problem with that is paul's game shines with the verticality i mean again it's not just the fact that you've got your trenches below your ground level but look at the bridges and walks There's, in the bottom center here you've got a bridge that goes across this trench and a bridge that crosses this trench. So you, you've got real 3D verticality to it. And most of the options that David and I looked at, they just don't have the functionality to make this game work as well as it should. So um, I think there's a real gap in the market for, for Paul to produce, even if it's like a, a bare MDF framework that you can then, you know, slap. Um, uh, modeling compound on and paint up so that it looks as good as these finished boards here from David, folks. Um, so yeah, keep your eyes peeled for that. And Paul has also let it slip that apparently there is. Okay, guys, my OBS is giving me loads of warnings about disconnecting and reconnecting. I don't know if I lost the stream. OK, the Sarissa stuff can make it work. OK, good to know. Um, let's go to I don't know if I'm still with you. Let's 
just check YouTube. Um, it's showing that I'm okay. Sorry about that, guys. Don't know what happened there. Um, I am showing excellent collection to my YouTube studio. Um, don't know what happened. Um, crap. Let's crack on with some news because I might lose the show altogether. Web browser. Okay, so just a few fun videos from YouTube um, this week. Um, not much in the way of news. Okay, we're, we've recovered. We have recovered. So first one, MS Paints. Um, Dave at MS Paints. Um, for anybody who follows Dave's channel, um, Dave had a bit of a, I think Dave had a bit of a crisis of um, faith in the whole YouTube thing and got sick of playing the algorithm and just making videos with tenuous 40k connections just to try and get more than 100 views being slightly hyperbolic there but you know what I mean um but he came out the other side of it and uh he said do you know what fuck it I'm gonna just make the videos I want to make and <coughs> his his um content has become much more varied and much more eclectic so he's done another video focusing on card games this time he's talking about the new star wars unlimited i think it's called card game from fantasy flight games um which is them reimagining because obviously fantasy flight have done at least three i think star wars related card games now uh, the one before this was Destiny, which had the weird dice mechanic in it. Um, this one looks more of a straight, straight up and down card game um, uh, with no sort of like weird. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? No weird. Um, uh, what's the fucking word? Um. Fill the airbrush up again with more primer. No weird novelty angle like the dice from Destiny. Um, there is a word, but my brain has gone. Um, yeah, uh, Dave's videography is awesome. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, kinks. No, I yeah, I know what I mean. Anyway, you guys know what I mean. Um like a when it when something's play pasted onto game just for its novelty value and to make it different without actually thinking whether this actually makes this game better or not um but anyway the good news is um he is going to be oh well g give it a go ewok i must confess it doesn't appeal to me at all um um but do you know what pick it up give it a try and let us know whether it's actually any good. Um, um, but th the good news is Dave will be making more card game videos. Um, I got into the comments and was sort of like giving him suggestions of dead games from the 90s that um, I enjoyed and bought far too much of um, to see if he would um, be looking at them. And the good news is he is. <laughs> he is. So uh, I'm, I'm massively invested. Um, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I I don't know if it's a good game or a bad game. Um, the main thing for me is like I I'm I'm completely meh on the aesthetic. I don't really want to play Disney's Aladdin in a card game. Um, it just doesn't do anything for me. Um, uh, so it it probably I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a good game. It's popular enough. But it's just not for me. Um, but like you say, if you've got people who want to play it, why not? I mean, um, talking of card games, let's stay on the topic before we move on. Um, uh, after Alex and I had finished, after I'd finished smashing Alex's face into the ground with um, uh, Infinity and being a bit of a being a bit of a that guy fucking opponent. Completely unintentionally, I might add, but still, that's the way it went. Um, I decided to, I said to him, look, 
we've got a little bit of time to kill. Do you fancy just trying the original Game of Thrones CCG? So, because I always carry spare decks with me in my um, hobby bag when I go to club. And uh, as a bit of a Game of Thrones fan, he was like, yeah, we'll give that a go. Um, and we had some good fun. Um, again, I, one of my New Year's resolutions is to um, do stuff. <coughs> Pardon me, everybody. Struggling with the cold here. To do stuff with the things that I own. Um, I mean, we've already talked about the extra things I'm buying and it's so hard to deny yourself and stop buying new things. But I already own so many games that are effectively dead and I haven't looked at in years, particularly card games. And I wanted to start getting some table time out of them. So uh, he ran uh, my uh, just sort of training wheel Stark deck and I played a uh, Greyjoy um, Warship deck. And it was good fun. We had a, we had a we had a blast. We didn't finish the game because um, obviously I was teaching him the ropes, so we were playing quite slow. But um, it was it was engaging, and it was it, it just felt fantastic to get table time out of something that I've not literally had out of a plastic box for a decade or more. Um, so if I can recommend to you guys. If you've got stuff gathering dust, find a way to get it back on the table. Um, hey, do you know what, mate? Card games can be great for that, though. Um, actually just giving somebody, you know, because, again, card games come in all sorts of flavors. You've got really complicated, convoluted card games. <coughs> or you've got actually quite simple card games where the I mean, I've played Keyforge. Um, I know that they suspended it and it'll be coming back again at some point. Um, <coughs> and obviously with its pre-constructed deck format, Keyforge isn't a huge cost. Uh, it isn't an investment in terms of money. And it's actually not a bad game. It's quite, it's okay. It's fine. Um, next shout out is Siege Studios. Um, I've, I don't watch painting stuff, so a lot of this sort of thing goes under my radar. Um, but, um, I've recently started getting into the, uh, Siege Studios podcasts. These things are about an hour and a half-ish, um, and <clears throat> they're very watchable. Um, the siege, the siege guys do a fantastic job. This is James, I think we've got on the screen, who I think is the head guy um, at Siege. But they're very watchable. Um, they discuss a lot of varied topics. They have hobby tips. They have um, they discuss business stuff. They discuss obviously painting tips and that sort of thing. Oh, Paul made a simple card game for the Chill Con freebie. Nice. It's ch chill cons this weekend, isn't it? Oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um. No, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it, Paul. I will. I will have a word with the wife. To be honest with you, I don't know if I'm going to be well enough at the moment. I could just bloody curl up and lay in bed. Um. So, but if I am, I'll, I'll have a look and see what the diary looks like, mate. Because again, it would be good to get to Chilcon. We were talking about um, talking about events. We were talking about Partisan at Newark, which I think is May the nineteenth. We might get a few of our gaming club lads to go down to Partisan. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Siege Studios, Paul. What were you talking about, boy? Um, Siege Studios. This particular video was, I think, very good. Um, Siege uh, got given one of the new Fnatic war paint sets from Mantic and they basically did an entire one and a bit hour stream on the Fnatic paints from Mantic and one thing you can say about these guys they know about painting models um, it is after all their business so um uh, it's really good. Uh, if you wanted to know, are the Fnatic paints any good? 
uh, where where are they hits? Where are they misses? You could do a lot worse than look. Check this video out. Um, it's extremely in depth, extremely thorough. Um, they cover painting actual models using the products in the flesh, um, and it's just a great video. So that one gets a recommendation. Um, yes, yeah, Sunny Derby. Um, oh, right. Uh, lastly. That I only watched this just before I came on tonight, but I thought I'd shout it out because it's a bloody awesome video. This is just 20 minutes edited from a live stream. These guys are playing board games. They're a Canadian outfit that literally, guess what they do? Um, they play board games. Um, uh, why do I like their channel? Um, Arkham Horror, the living card game, is one of the games they cover absolutely obsessively. So I am all over their Arkham content. Um, as those of you who are regulars will know, it's one of my obsessions and passions. <coughs> and um, Justin, I think it is, the guy who sort of like the, the big man on the channel, did this video where he was uh, using this weird web browser thing called, I think it's called Infinite Craft. And basically what you do is you, you, can, you start with air earth fire and water and then you combine them by drag and drop and it gives you new things it crafts you new words or new objects or whatever you however you want to put it they're basically just word tags um and he's he set himself the challenge he wanted to create arkham horror as a word tag starting with fire water air and earth and obviously, I think it did take him hours and hours and hours because this is just the edited highlights. But, you know, salute the guy. He did it. <laughs> and he actually ended up going a complete rabbit hole, down a rabbit hole. And he combined, combined all the tags and actually got Arkham Horror Living Card Game and all of the expansions and loads of expansions that don't exist and are just AI created. Um, and it's just, if you've got 20 minutes and you just want a bit of watch a bit of fun um i would recommend this um very much so um so yeah and that's all i've got in terms of um uh, news um oh my god <laughs> last time you know last time i was in derby i went to a sikh wedding i think it was uh that is a good few years ago though um i honestly couldn't tell you how many years ago that was uh but it was fun great food absolutely amazing food um but yeah that was good um <clears throat> so yeah that's it that's the um news so we've we've come up to nine o'clock i didn't think we'd do this well but it just goes to show that i'm a boring old twat with verbal diarrhea um so uh let's talk a little bit about our main topic so one of the things that's um uh, a factor or a part of all tabletop gaming is probability okay we've talked about it before on the um stream we we've talked about the merits of randomness and how much random is too random and when should you use random events and probability and when should you not but one of the things i don't really think we've talked about is how much people or or gamers actually consider the the random or probability based events in their games when they're playing okay so like <clears throat> for most games if you crack con that's the guys who do the um seventh sun and those guys isn't it uh, painted plastic crack podcast isn't it Plastic Crack Podcast, Shackos. Um, yeah, that does look like a cool event. Um, small events are the way to go, guys. I mean, David and I obviously do sing the praises of UKGE. But if 
I, the problem with UKG is it's a huge investment of time and resources to do the thing properly because it's over multiple days. Um, and I, I'm, you know, if you want, a, if you if you want a great uh, convention experience, look in your local area for a small event because the ticket price will be a fraction of these big ticket events. But trust me, the rewards won't be a fraction. They're still, and in fact, in some ways, they're more fun because you don't feel like there's anything you, you can experience more without feeling that you're missing out on a ton of the content. Um, and you can take it at a more leisurely pace. It's not as stressful. So, I mean, if you buy a one day ticket at UK Games Expo for 30 odd quid, 40 quid, are they now a day? Um you got two or three of the big exhibition halls at Birmingham NEC to get around in a few hours. You can feel the stress of that. Um, and do you know what? A local show where there's, you know, four or five participation games and six or eight retailers, you can have four or five hours of actual relaxed fun, grab your lunch, make a day of it, but without all the stress. Um, so yeah, don't, don't sleep on these small cons guys. Um, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir for a lot of my audience in the chat, <clears throat> but if you're catching us later on YouTube, small cons, don't, don't sleep on them. Yeah. Oh, you, you actually run games there, Shakos. That's cool. No, that's the other thing, Ewok. Obviously, UK Games Expo is primarily board games now don't get me wrong i think the needle is swinging you do get big exhibitors like games workshop tt combat um they're they're definitely there but there is a lot more there do you know what i mean um role playing board games um uh, as well as the miniature stuff um and I, I think in you know it's it there is definitely getting to be more for miniatures gamers at UKGE as the years go on. Uh, as I say, last year particularly was great. There were some really nice, unique little games there um being shown off. Um <coughs> but um coming back to maths, so what about you guys in the chat? When you're playing your games, do you, so, I mean, let's thinking about, let's take an example, right? If, say, you're uh, playing a war game and you have, you, you've got a model or a unit and you can charge into combat against your opponent and you can either charge into a, an enemy model, which gives you, you know, a certain, you're hitting on certain numbers and, you know, um, you've got a certain chance to hit and a certain chance to damage. And then if you attack another unit, you might have different or better odds. If you think about the whole chain of events and dice rolls, you might have a better chance against another unit, unit B. Um, do you guys spend a lot of time on those decisions? Or does it, or, or are you guys the kind of gamers where there are other things that come that are in the forefront of your mind than actually just crunching through the numbers and working out what is the optimal play at this point in terms of probability and outcomes? What's what's your um, take on it? To be, I, I, I'm going to push back there and Ewok and say, ask you, did you try demo games of of a lot of the games that were there or were you just not interested in that? Or were you going as a war gamer with a very particular agenda or, you know, you were looking for something specific? Because like David and I played some great games at, at this year's UKGE, we played that Zeo Genesis, um, which is the the sort of uh, Gundam style uh, game from um, I think it's designed by a couple of ex Games Workshop guys. Um, 
Uh, we played that game that's based on Yeah, so Darren says, I don't do that whatsoever. I just go with a mix of gut instinct and a touch of role playing. David Smith's, I know I don't really prioritize probabilities. Only game I do is that in the majority is Infinity because of it being tight. Only three turns. Andy Chambers, that was it. Thank you, mate. Um, because, <clears throat> you know... If you go to UKGE and you're only interested in what's happening with the war games, dig a bit deeper. Do you know what I mean? Don't just walk around the trade stands. Play the demo games. Get involved. Um, yeah, so Paul says, if I play other people's games, you'll play for fun, no thinking, just for laughs. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, Christ Almighty, we, what did we play this year, David? Read them off. What, there was that game, I can't remember the name of it, and I'm really shit. The one that was like weird, uh, sort of like Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, but space, that sort of like pulpy, um, on the surface of Mars one with the airship things, um, Orinoco says I get analysis paralysis. Oh, good evening, Orinoco. First time I've seen you post. You've probably posted before, but I've not registered it. So better if there's a time limit or if I try to play fast. Yeah, definitely, mate. I think there is an element that that's an interesting element because if you're the kind of war gamer who does obsess about the optimal decision all of the time, is there an element of discourtesy to your opponent where your play grinds to the point where it's so slow <coughs> that you actually start to frustrate your opponent and bore them? So that is a very good point, um, Orinoco. I think there is a, an element of social contract in there. Um, Shekos, I like thinking in a game about decisions, but I don't want to be thinking about the maths behind it. Um, <laughs> a game demoer who cheats uh okay then that sounds like a please refer to our how not to run a demo game video for david and i's potentially views on demo gamers who cheat at their own games what a fucking idiot um yeah, I mean, I don't know. You guys are pretty much saying what I suspected. I think most people don't. Um, but I, it has to be said um, that I think if you are the kind of person who can compute basic probabilities on the fly... Okay, so I've got... You know, so with dice, I've got a three in six chance of hitting and a two in six chance of wounding. So that means I'm going to get on average X wounds, blah, blah, blah. I think if you can do that, you probably will be a better gamer because, you know, you can say, well, I can attack that unit with a 60 to 70 percent chance of winning or I can attack that unit with a 40 percent chance of winning. Oh, well, in that case, I'm definitely attacking that unit. <clears throat> so it I, I don't think it can be you can't escape the reality that if this is something that you can do you will be a better gamer oh shit <coughs> he cheats at local games night and humble brags about games he would out while playing ball games <laughs> that sounds awesome mate he sounds like a great guy uh yeah awesome <coughs> Still, <laughs> thank thankfully the rest of us don't have to um, put up with that. Um, I'm having a bit of a mare because the airbrush is blocked, um, um, which is entirely my fault. Just bear with me while I fix my nightmare. Oh, crap.
No, what have I done? What have I done? Ah! Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm having a nightmare. Uh, man breaks airbrush live on stream. Uh, nightmare had by all. What the hell have I done? Okay, my airbrushing might be done with. Oh, no. Cross your fingers, guys. Cross your fingers. He's a dick. Fortunately, he's scared of dogs, so we all do the game we can. <laughs> <coughs> I you say terrible people, I say creative. Um uh, Yeah, yeah, uh that is the truth, and you can't feel sorry for them, Darren, I'm afraid. Um it, it's it's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> Yeah, that's that that counts as avoiding him, Ewok. Just just so you know, mate. That that it that does count as that. <coughs> right, guys. Yeah, I think I fixed it. I think I fixed it. Famous last words. Let's try some paint. See how we get on. Ah, uh, airbrushing, eh? Oh yes, right. Um, right. We are we are back in business. We have we have gone back on track. Okay, I'm back on the hobby wagon. Where were we? Okay. Um. So, as I say, I. Uh, the other thing that I wondered, right, here's a question. Is it, now our hobby is quite niche, right? Is is the fact that the, the maths is often quite in your face, is that one of the things that sort of stops people engaging? Because, I mean, even with board games, say you've got like a random deck of cards or dice to generate events in board games, often there's so much going on in the board game that actually the impact of those random elements is either well masked or hidden from the players behind other considerations which might be thematic or um you know less in your face the thing with war gaming is is often those sort of like probability based interactions are actually quite overt. Do you know what I mean? Like, you'll take a turn, and what the dice do will severely impact your turn. Is there, is there an element there where you think that that could be one of the big turn-offs? What, what, what keeps people from coming to our hobby? Um, <coughs> um, what's in the back? <laughs> Cheat, you forget. Who, the guy who always looks in the bag at playing quacks what the fuck i mean again ultimately i i think those sort of people are to be pitied more than blamed because uh, I, i'm sorry guys maybe this is going to sound arrogant but you know i've got a wife i've got a family i've got quite a good job um i may not enjoy it but it's well paid and it's quite high skill so i don't need to inflate my ego by beating somebody into the ground during a fucking board game do you know what i mean i'm not 
I'm not looking for that sort of like affirmation of character. And uh, I think somebody who's insecure enough or, I don't know, pathologically um, fucking under, you know, got pathologically low self-esteem to the point where they only feel of value if they've whipped somebody's ass at some pointless board game that means nothing is definitely more to be pitied than blamed. But that's my view. Your mileage may differ. Um, yeah. No, we haven't, man. Um, I think we were in a much we're in a much better position than so pre nineties. We're going to more simulation or at infinity. Um, he's definitely got that on smart than everyone else. And to be fair, he is really intelligent. That's even more pathetic, though, Ewok, to be fair. Because if the guy is actually quite bright, so could win at games without cheating, and yet still cheats, that's even more pathetic. Um, again, if you're a bit, you know, if you're of average intellectual capacity um, and do, you know, do you feel that you can't win if you play fair? That's fair. But if, you know, I mean, that's well, it's not fair, but it's certainly more. Em you can have more empathy for that person than somebody who is smart enough to know fucking better and doesn't need to play. doesn't need to be like that, frankly. Um, so David's there's mentioned pools versus single roles. I suppose. That's the kind of thing that maybe I was just talking about, David, because. What the fuck? OK. OK. I'm just going to just bear with me, guys. I'm going to have to flush this airbrush out because now. Oh, no, it's fixed. The air, the air valve was jammed open. I think, do you know what? I was saying to somebody the other day that I've never had to deep clean my airbrush. That day may just have arrived here live on stream. Um, to be fair, I've had this badge in there for, what, five years? And I clean it thoroughly after each session, but I've not had to like dismantle it and sonic bath it. But now it looks like it's going that way. Um, uh, I agree, it, Darren. Uh, social intelligence isn't there. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> Grand Forest <it> cheats. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely. This is this is a lot of the argument that's made about old school war games, though, where that there, there was literally um, uh, sort of like systems to control everything in the game. We played a god awful board game from the 90s, one of the Games Workshop ones, Warrior Knights, I think it was called. And oh, my God, the the clunky, convoluted nature of that was worn bare on its sleeve. Um, and it, and even some of the horrible random elements, like there was this stupid event deck um, that basically made the the rest of the game pointless because all you you know the flips of those cards could derail the entire rest of the game. And uh, I think we said at the time when we spoke about playing it at club, you can imagine a scenario where you play the game for three hours, then flip a card, and then suddenly everybody gets wiped out. And the whole game state is reset almost to the beginning again. And it's just like, no, no, fuck this. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, technical difficulties. Yay! Um, so and then back to the topic, I have to give Kings of War for giving me lots of fun decisions to math out. Yep. Um, uh, Kings of War is like, yeah, Kings of War is a very good game. It's the best rank and flank game, I think, at the moment. Um, 
yeah, you should do, Paul. Um, it's so playable. It it has it's got all those things going for it. It's got great table presence. <coughs> the pace of the game is really good. Um, uh, and the the actual underlying game isn't so complicated that it 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 makes it a chore to play. Um, uh, and you really feel that you've got agency in it. I like it a lot. As I say, it's by far and away my favourite rank and flanker. Um, and I do like that type of game. I would say it's, it has to be said, it's a better game than fantasy. I probably enjoy the fun of fantasy more because it is a bit more random and a bit more, fuck, let's just see what happens. But it's a better game. It can't be argued that it's not. Um, yeah, David said about single rolls versus dice pool. That was exactly what I meant about things being less overt. So let's take, for example, Infinity. I think one of the things about Infinity is in, in a lot of situations, you and your opponent are rolling one D20 each. And the whole basis of the interaction is based on that roll. And you roll one d20 each and you have a whole host of modifiers so you have plus three for this minus three for that plus three six for this minus three for that and you work out all of your modifiers to see what your target number is and then you both roll that d20 and there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser and it's it's really out there it's in your face what's going on it's not hidden at all I think, where, like David says, when you've got like a dice pool game, I mean, let's take Kings of War as an example because we've mentioned it. You roll, you've got a unit attacking in Kings of War and it's got like 18 attacks hitting on threes and you roll a massive fistful of dice and then you roll a massive fistful of dice again to see whether you wound and that. And you might, and then after you've done that, you then roll the dice to see whether you've, broken the enemy's nerve or do a nerve tech check or whatever and the way that that goes i think there's there's enough there's enough going on there that you actually don't stop and think hang on a minute you know if i'd have rolled this or if i'd have rolled that or you don't look at you down at your pile of 18 dice and goes that's not a very that rolls really skewed because like three quarters of those are under three or do you know what i mean i think certain people will don't get me wrong but i don't think your average gamer does i think your average gamer just gets on with it um yeah uh totally give you that uh ewok Yeah, the thing is, Ewok, all I can say to you on that, so Ewok says that, um, if I read him right, that the he finds the Kings of War intimidating in terms of paint. I'm assuming you mean because there are such a lot of models, Ewok, like you've got 80 to 100 models to paint, and you've got friends who like are doing like studio quality finishes on stuff um mate don't worry about it paint for yourself don't don't paint for other people don't you know they might be golden demon winning talents but they're not painting your army just just do a do what do what suits you mate don't worry about it um i i think that a lot of this high high um I think a lot of this high-end painting is very demotivating for the average Joe. And I'm not a massive fan um, of really top-end. I'm not a massive fan of obsessing about top-end paint for that reason. Um, <clears throat> I, we've, we've said this before, Shackos and Sprues. The actual choice of dice isn't relevant. The, the, 
you can design a good game around the lowly D6. The other game design elements are more important than choosing what the dice you've used. If you if you know that you're choosing a dice with a very narrow random range, like a D6, you've just got to take account of that in the other design space of your game. Do you know what I mean? Um, it, it, there is absolutely nothing to say that because a game has a is only d6 based it's going to be worse than a game that's d10 based um I, I can't think of an example off the top of my head but i am fairly sure i will have played games that use larger randomization spreads that are shitter than games that use d6s um you know it, it's not about the choice of dice it's about the other game design elements that support that um I, I am of the belief anyway. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, the other thing is, are cards a better way of doing it? I mean, obviously, the, in terms of miniature war games, there's only really Malifaux that uses a deck of cards for its main randomization engine. Can you th guys think of any more? Oh, fucking War on Terror. Don't even go there, mate. Um, uh, Um, uh, I've come to read Darren says I've come to realise games like modern 40k where you roll so much dice it turns <coughs> to a more average or to the point where the game could be redesigned uh, that's true Paul that is very true although it's not all games handle it well I mean, yeah pretty much yeah good call David Moonstone Moonstone yeah Moonstone's a great example because Moonstone, the Moonstone, the R in there isn't. You see, Moonstone's a fantastic game and a fantastic example for this because it, it, does everybody but agree with me? There isn't any random in Moonstone, is there? The combat deck, where you choose cards to play against your opponent in that pseudo snap-like mini game. None of that's random. You choose the cards. I guess you get a random hand of cards, don't you? So you don't know what you're working with. So I guess there is randomization. It, it's not as if you have access to all of your cards. Um, you know, you do have a limited set to work from. So you have to base the decisions on what you do with that limited set. Um, so, yeah, no, that is true. Um But again, I suppose the thing is, again, we're talking about a, that's a good piece of game design where because you get to choose what card you play down, it's attempting to mask the fact that it is random. You know, and it maybe this is one of the why the game is su so successful, because it's such, it does such a good job of masking the random elements of it and making them feel less overt. Um, I mean, War on Terror, David and I had a good old rant about that. I think let's let's have two things here. Let's talk about War on Terror. So. Yeah, yeah, it's player interaction, Darren, definitely. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so you've got an example there, Shakos, of a historical that uses both. They, see, that's a very board game thing. Modern board games will often incorporate little decks of cards and dice and... Do you know what I mean? They've got everything going on there. And there's often so much going on. <coughs> I think people can, like, lose sight of the fact that Again, when there's so much going on like that, you don't feel so invested in the outcome of one event. And it can be a bit more... It can soften the blow for you, you know, when you roll really badly, because there's all those other things going in your favour. I mean, w War on Terror, the big problem I had with War on Terror was... I think 
there were two things that absolutely said when I looked at War on Terror as a game design, I was like, I am not up for this anymore. The first one was the tables the that you cross referenced the value you need to succeed on. Um I think that with modern war gaming we need to move away from that. I mean <clears throat> The strength toughness chart of old world where equal is four, less is three, more is five, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. But the complexity of the interaction table in War on Terror for me was like, nope, I don't think I'm I'm not up for this. The other thing that absolutely I was like, no, I'm not up for this with War on Terror was the randomization of variables. So instead of cover being minus two on my dice roll, for example, cover could be minus d6 or minus d8 so it's like hang on a minute that that barrel could either reduce my hit roll by one or reduce my hit roll by eight are you fucking serious that just seemed a level random on top of random that didn't that i was not up for do you know what i mean certainly in the game as it was being sort of like pitched at me. Um, I didn't get that. Um, because again, it seemed unnecessary. If you really want a truly random outcome, just that both players roll a D20 and don't allow any modifiers, then it's fucking, you know, anything can happen. But why, why sort of like granularize a process? Um, with all of these sort of details and then say, yeah, but after it comes down to it, it's just like fucking roll after roll after roll after roll. Um, which brings me round to 40k, which has the same problem. I think Darren said about modern 40k. To give you my TLDR, Darren, I think modern 40k goes wrong because there's too much mitigation of dice. There's too much re-roll this, re-roll ones, re-roll misses, re-roll, re-roll, re-roll. Ultimately, if you're going to allow people to re-roll everything, why fucking have the dice in the first place? Do you know what I mean? You either want dice in the process or you don't. If you don't want them, take them out. But don't put them in there and then let make everybody re-roll them three times. Plus the fact, I think in 40K's core game design... They just roll too many fucking dice. You compare Kings of War to 40k. So in Kings of War and one page rules while we're on the subject. In Kings of War, you roll to hit, you roll to damage. Two rolls. In 40k, you roll to hit, you roll to wound, you roll to save. Then you might have another damage mitigation step like feel no pain or whatever. Four dice rolls instead of two. Hmm. Yeah, no. We're just rolling dice for the sake of rolling dice and at this point. Yeah, uh, that was exactly my feelings at Ewok when we were playing it and I was like, hang on a minute. So every time I need to determine cover, I've got to roll some dice. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, Darren. It's like... And again, if you look, go back and review all of the 40k armies that were in the press over the last two years because they were OP or broken. All at the look at Eldar, right? How long have Eldar been in the press as a broken 40k army and why are they broken? Eldar are broken in 40k because the um, I think it's it's called the fate dice mechanic, isn't it? Basically, you get a bunch of dice that if you don't like the look, if you don't like the outcome that you're going to get or you don't want something to be random, you just pick one of your fate dice and that's what you get. So you basically just overrule the dice. And this has happened time and again. You know, once you get a faction that can stack re-rolls like plus one to every roll, re-roll every roll. I mean, um, this is where they break the game. Yeah, and there aren't that. And compared, there are two things about Kings of War that make it work better, Ewok. Number one, like you've said, the buffs are limited in scope. 
and universal. So what does Elite do? You re-roll, re-roll ones to hit. Who can get Elite? Every single army in the game can have it on one or more units. What does Vicious do? It allows you to re-roll ones to wound. Who can get Vicious? Every faction, because it'll be on probably one or more of their units in the game. The, the, there, it's just... You, you take gaming ideas and you keep them simple and keep them ever present so that nobody feels locked out. Yeah. Well, and again, to be fair, and, and this is where you can actually defend Games Workshop, right? <coughs> the problem with Games Workshop is that their design team has created a Frankenstein monster that they cannot control. Their, their armies are far too convoluted. Their rules are far too complex. They can't balance it. They, they lost control at the design process, and now there's no going back. You know, that's why the reset at 8th edition was so good, where they stripped all of the abilities off the index cards or the data sheets. And you had, a, like in 8th edition, you had two-thirds of the units in the game were like a stat profile, one ability. That's why the 8th edition index game was such a playable and accessible Nightfall uh, version of 40k. Because they stripped out all the stuff that they'd lost control of. And now they've just iterated it all back on top. And they've gone back to where they were at the end of the Nightmare of 7th edition. With just far too much to even get a, a grip on. Um, I think... I, I come in, let's have some final thoughts on our maths topic. I I'm I'm quite a bathy guy and I really enjoy the maths of wargaming. I I enjoy I enjoy infinity interactions even though they are as prickly as hell. I enjoy working out whether my um Let's use that example that I so said earlier, my uh, Diokai versus that Faseed. So, like, I know the Faseed is firing with a machine, heavy machine gun, so it's plus three at the range band we're at. The, um, the Faseed has a suppression order, so I'm minus three to hit him. Um, then I've got cover, so that's minus three to him. He's in cover, I've got minus three to him. I love crunching all that out and, like, I knew when I rolled that dice against that for seed, I I had a tiny chance of winning it, and I I liked the fact that I was able to work that out. It was still my best option, and I still went for it because I didn't have a better way to deal with the for seed easily, um, particularly because of his resistance to being hacked, <coughs> um, and my weak hackers. Um, so. I, I was happy with the decision, but I knew where I stood. But I can totally see why some gamers would find that part of the game something that they'd rather skim over or rather not focus their not their uh, attention on. Um, um, and I think. Here's here's the last question for you guys then. So like, I I think it's fairly obvious that you don't need to you don't need to obsess about the the actual mechanisms that drive the game you're playing to enjoy the game you're playing. If you do understand them to a great you know a, a really strong degree it'll probably help you win but it doesn't obviate it doesn't rule out enjoying the process for what it is and the game for what it is and maybe that that even more than that it needs to be said that you should ensure that the game is enjoyable even if you don't you know obsess about the numbers because it maybe there's a maybe there's a, a moral there that if the game stops being fun when you're not obsessing about the numbers the game's not very good night david um 
I can't think. I suppose, I don't know, is 40k an example of that? Where, you know, it's just too much. Um, but yeah, uh, as I say, I, 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 th I think that, um, I've got one more bridge to do. So let's, let's see how we get on with this. Um, I, <clears throat> I suppose also the, the, the thing is with that the game again we're coming back to sort of like things we've discussed before I'm all about developing the story on the table nowadays I only feel the game is unfolding it always give me something totally out there from what I was expecting yeah when they're um What do you mean when they break your immersion, Darren? When like things, because I mean sometimes the unexpected in a game can be fun. Like you know you making the role that you you know your little lowly guy. It's like Frostgrave. Um, you know your lowly little thug manages to kill the giant worm by a massive fluke roll. Um, or do you mean in a more specific sense that? Um, where like the rules, the 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 mechanics literally don't match at all what you're doing. What do you mean by that? I think I I think that as well that it comes down to game design. I think your game should have enough elements in it that aren't random to keep the player engaged as well. Um, you know, randomness is a great storytelling device. I mean, who's who's heard that? Who's heard that one about Dungeons and Dragons, right? So D and D. One of the things I see all the time on YouTube content and in forums is that the dice tell the story. You know, I hate that. I hate that concept. I, I know that the people are probably not trying to say what it sounds like to me. But what there's what I hear when I hear that is that the the story's random then. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like that we haven't got any agency to shape it. It's just whatever we roll is what happens. Um and and i'm i'm not up for that i i want to engage with the crunch of my game <coughs> oh yeah i mean but that's that's a complexity thing again darren you're far more likely to get gotchered in a game where there's far too much going on and you can forget even simple things if there's a criticism for infinity that is a that is that is a criticism for infinity infinity is such a dense rule set that you if you unless your opponent is a very generous spirited individual you could easily sort of like set yourself up for something and then your opponent goes uh yeah except i ignore cover uh and i've got minus six mimetism which you didn't take into account uh and and immediately you're like, oh, so what you're saying is that I'm looking for a two or less on a D20 uh, and you're looking for a, like a 16 or less on a D20. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. Gotcha-ing, though, is as much about players as it is about scenarios or games. And again, we come back to this thing, win at all costs. I, I would rather say to somebody, hang on, stop, before you do this, you have remembered I've got mimetism six, yeah, or you do know that 
I've got marksmen, so I'll ignore your cover. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't, I don't want to win. I don't want to win because I knew the rules better. I want to win because I made better decisions. <coughs> if that makes sense. That's probably a really bad way of putting it because it sounds really, like, contradictory. But I'm hoping you guys get what I mean by that. Um... Yeah. To be honest with you, Darren, probably not. I mean, I I I feel that like I know you reasonably well because you've been along a, a as a, a watcher on the stream for a very long time, and uh, obviously we we know what your taste in games is. I don't think Infinity is necessarily a game for you, mate. No, it's extremely granular. It's extremely fiddly, um, and. I tell you what will happen in Infinity. If you make a couple of bad decisions, your entire game will collapse. Um, and there won't be any coming back from it. Um, so, do I think it's a game for you? No, it probably is not. But not every game is for every player. Um, I played a big game of COC at Lard Workshop. Amazing table, amazing minis. Worst game I'd ever played due to the winner or cost opponent. Oh, that's awful, man. Chain of Command. Yeah. The thing is, that's it. Opponents make games. Yeah, opponents make games. And I agree, Shakos. Um, all, that's the one thing that all of those Joseph games have got in spades. That storytelling uh, element. Um, and again, the, the, the Joseph McCulloch stable of games are a great example where being the sort of player because <coughs> again it levels the playing field okay if you're the sort of player who wants to leverage your odds and calculate everything before you do it fine you do that but i'm telling you now in Frostgrave, you'll be lucky if you've got a two or three point advantage on a d20 roll if you've done that you've got a fit you've probably leveraged the game as hard as you can leverage it so you've effectively got a 10% odds increase over your opponent. The game doesn't... The, the dice will decide what the dice will decide. Um, and, and I don't dislike those games. In fact, I love them for what they are. But um, as I say, they're, they're definitely a... Um, what's the word? They're, they're definitely a, a foil to those gamers who want to crunch every number and leverage the odds to their favour to every interaction. <laughs> I'm waiting for these mobiles to show themselves right. Yeah, well, you and I know, Darren, that that is the way life goes. You'll think, oh, they're all great. And then the primer hits them and you're like, fuck me, did I even bother putting the mold lines, getting the mold lines off? Um... <clears throat> so yeah, a bit of a waffly topic tonight, guys. I think I definitely missed my co-host and his input. Um, but it, it's really tricky um, to keep an eye on everything when you're flying solo like this. Um, but yeah, um, in summary, if you're the kind of gamer who does love the crunch of a good war game. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel bad. Um, just maybe consider thinking about or asking your opponent why they're playing the game and what they're playing it for. Because what whatever else happens, if they have a really shit time and you have a great night, the chances are you probably won't be playing that game against them again. And honestly, there are not enough of us about for you to be that contemptuous of the person standing on the other side of the table from you. Um, so just because you can calculate the odds of success of any interaction, you know, because you've counted your opponent's Malifaux deck and you know that they've got like a 7% chance of flipping a face card and you've got 21% chance of flipping a face card. 
don't don't make that the only thing that the game's about. Because yeah, that's what assholes do. <laughs> oh guys. Uh, do you know what? it's probably the most satisfying part of the show being flamed by your audience um so yeah thanks very much uh Arinalco there saying that uh my asmr airbrush was a great stand-in for david um uh and obviously ewoks got us covered with david's verbal tics um so yeah all's good in the hood um, we hope I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Um, and if you're catching us later on YouTube, um, I hope you enjoyed the show also. <clears throat> um, I'm going to finish this off. We're going to overrun probably, but do you know what? I am going to finish this off because I am so close that I can taste it. Or it could be that I can just taste primer because I've been doing this whole session without my mask on. Don't do this at home, kids. But so that I could live stream and use my airbrush. Um, obviously, polyurethane primer is not uh, and never will be a substitute for good, clean air. Um, so don't treat your body with contempt like I do. Uh, make sure you use a mask when you're priming or using an airbrush in any way, to be honest. Um, and particularly if your ventilation's not good, get yourself a good quality mask. I do have one, but can I stream in it? No, not not at all. What the hell? Let's have a drop of water in this. Um, where am I? <coughs> Ah, uh, right. I think we're there. I think we are there. Oh, no. Missed a bit. Missed a bit. Missed a bit. <coughs> right. We're going to have to call it. We're going to be fiddling about getting all these extra little bits done. Right, knock it on the head, Paul. Call it a day. Put the old airbrush down. Turn the air compressor off. Uh... <laughs> Telling us not to use a laser cut for eye surgery. You know, that idea might have merit. Uh, no, don't do that at home, kids. Can you imagine that? Should we encourage David to buy a laser cutter for MDF? How, how can you imagine the fun and games that might ensue on live streams with smoke billowing through the room as he realizes it's, it's set fire while we're live on air? I can I can actually imagine that it's too clearly. It's scary. Right. OK, come on, Paul. Look, let's wind the stream up. It's coming up to 10 o'clock. Thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the name waffle, the news and all of the goings on. Thank you, as usual, to the guys over here to my um, uh, right on screen, as you're seeing me left in real life. Um, uh, the chat, they are the guys who make the show. Um... <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's true. He could have done. Um, he could have won one. You see, we could do the old uh, bullseye. Here's what you could have won. Um, so, yeah, if you're watching us later on YouTube, thank you very much. If you can only do one thing tonight, please click the like button. Um, it just helps us with the YouTube algorithm and reaching out to a wider audience because um, not a lot of people want to watch idiots talk for two hours on YouTube. Who's Who'd thunk it? Um, hopefully we'll be back with a normal show next week and David will be feeling back um, to his normal self. 
Um, uh, so until then, um, don't forget painting competition. So there is a link in the uh, video description below. Um, if you want to take part, you can send me a picture to that email address. Um, the topic for this month is upgrade, upgrade, whatever spin on that wants to take your fancy, be creative, be fun, paint something that you want to paint. That's the whole point of the painting competition. Um, A, participate and B, just get something done. Um, if you can do any of the stuff, share, comment, subscribe. Yeah, that's fine. Do all that stuff as well if you can. But a like button is all that we ask for. Um, and I think <clears throat> with my voice going and my brow covered in sweat, um, I am going to call it a night, guys. And I will see you next week.